uh, interacting with each other in this kind of ad hoc network. All right, Carl, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to come over and get the, uh, the clicker. So hi, um, I'm Carl. I'm, I'm from Washington, D.C. Uh, Nobles is probably a company you have not heard of before, but we're a, a not-for-profit bipartisan think tank. We do a, a lot of long-term strategy technology planning for almost every government agency with an acronym that you can think of. That includes the civilian and non-civilian side. Um, as Chris mentioned, I've spent a lot of time in my career in connected vehicles, connected automated vehicles on the surface side, uh, supporting uh, the ITS Joint Program Office uh, in DC. But uh, the other, one of the other roles that I play is I am the uh, portfolio manager of our internal R&D effort, which is the Nobles Sponsored uh, Research NSR program, which touches all of our client space. And what I can say is that um, one of the trends that we've seen coming for some time is this confluence of uh, blockchain uh, or distributed ledger technologies with uh, autonomy and, uh, and across the, the market, not just in the civilian space, but uh, across all the spaces that we, um, that we serve, the, the federal government. I happen to uh, have the opportunity to, to meet Chris and find out about Moby in, uh, in July when we were together in uh, San Francisco at AVS. And I think there's a lot of great stuff that, um, that, that we've that we have learned in other places, uh, in other, other spheres, that I think have a lot of potentially interesting application for the uh, surface and near surface use case on the, on the civilian side. Um, I will say we, we started working with, with blockchain when our intelligence and law enforcement clients became very interested in what people were doing with Bitcoin um, in the very, very, very early, primarily to figure out you know, what was behind it. They didn't really uh, see at that point, I think, the, the broader value of it. I think we're all coming around to that uh, now, but I think we've, we've seen it in a, in a couple of different spaces. So what I'll, I'll do here on, on this first slide, just, just real quick, is one of the, the things that, um, that we see, the, the confluence in the civilian space, well, really in all the spaces, uh, it includes the, um, the notion of, and I think uh, Dr. Krakauer got to it, if you have a team, or not even a very good team, or a, a team of under direct hierarchical control, a bunch of autonomous en entities, that and be trying to solve a specific use case, it can be very expensive, very brittle, and relatively insecure because of the homogeneity of the units uh, and a bunch of other things going on in the system anyway. So there are natural strengths to having ad hoc heterogeneous autonomous entities that are, can adapt and form units to either conduct specific actions or to get out of each other's way, okay? So in this case, in the federal, uh, in, the, in the civilian side, most of our use cases are in that latter category. There's a lot of potentially autonomous entities in proximity to each other they have different particular missions they want to perform. They are not against each other. They're allied to some degree. But number one, they do not want to conflict with each other. So allowing those entities to play really good pickup basketball, that's my metaphor of the moment. If we can, if we can allow those players to play like they played together for 20 years, it makes a really great ad hoc basketball team. They don't have to train. They could train separately, but if they get together, and they know what they're doing, the, the impacts can be awesome. Uh, and I think I'm a big modeling simulation guy, so some of the kinds of things that we've done show there's a tremendous amount of social benefit, benefit to everybody from these kinds of flexible, ad hoc, autonomous constructs. Okay, how do we get there? That's sort of the problem. Uh, so Novus, we've laid out in a and one of our white papers, we call the pieces of eight concept. There are eight specific technologies or issues that have to be resolved. Identity is a big one. We just talked a lot about that one, but it's one of the eight. Three of them relate to things that blockchain specifically can solve. So I'm going to start at the high level here, here talking about use cases that go from surface and near surface all the way to orbital and why it may be important to have a similar kind of framework to address those kinds of ad hoc team building because Cars need to avoid the drones that are landing near them, 
and the drones that are avoiding each other near surface also need to avoid the commercial aircraft above them that need to avoid the or orbital launch vehicles. I'm not going to go into, that's not my talk today. <laughs> I just thought it, it's, we've, had, we've really focused on the surface, which is great, uh, but really there's a, there's a multi-layer cake to solve. Uh, and I think one of the things I would just offer is that if we approach it in a similar way, in all of those layers, then we don't have to have like 97 different systems for integrating them all. Okay, so, and then I'm gonna come all the way back down really to this, this notion of the, of the surface transportation problem and the, the relatively um, interesting but still very pragmatic problem of cooperative uh, obstacle detection and path planning. Okay. So I'm gonna start by describing the sort of this notion, this pieces of eight framework, and you'll see it uh, in, throughout here, uh, in terms of at the highest level here talking about an IoT relationship. IoT trust is a huge thing. Zach, you made a tremendous number of points. That's exactly right. I agree with everything he said about it. If you don't have, a, if you don't have trust, you don't have, a, you don't have a team. You don't have a solution, right? Um, and so there's a way of thinking about these interactions if you have heterogeneous, unfamiliar, frequently recurring interactions, you're playing a lot of pickup basketball, you need to be able to understand the team that you just got thrown in together and their strengths and weaknesses. So let's think about uh, heterogeneous, unfamiliar devices uh, in proximity to each other, in a boundary where somebody can at least listen to this one particular entity which is broadcasting information. We have three fundamental types of things that we expect uh, that entity to produce. One is identity and position. Number two is what it senses around it. Number three is where it intends to go next. Okay, those are the three fundamental things these guys can share or broadcast. And within the ecosystem, we have other groups, these little scrabble tiles, entities that use that information, right? They may be interested in where that entity is, who it thinks it is, what it senses, where it's going. And then we may have other entities in the system that can verify the accuracy of the information provided. Uh, so these are roles that can get played, but if we're really interested in one particular item, let's just say this particular unit, the user, wants to know how trustworthy is B's position, right? That's very important to it for some reason. Doesn't want to collide with it. How trustworthy, how accurate is it? There may be a verifier in proximity that can say something like, oh, it's 90% accurate. That's great, that's great. But that's just one game of pickup basketball, right? Maybe this particular entity is not so accurate in general. We'd like to know the whole history. So really, you one would like to talk to somebody about how much can I trust information coming from B? In general, or specifically to some of these uh, types of information that's being passed or broadcast. And this would accumulate all of the individual accuracy reports, essentially all the pickup basketball games that this particular unit has played in the past. We could get a sense of whether a good pass or a bad pass. I'm gonna drop the metaphor from there. But anyway, the things that it does, does well and the things it does not do well. So one of the, the notions is that securing this information, this record of transactions essentially among the, the machines speaking to each other, broadcasting information, verifying information, is ideal to be stored in a place that everybody can see it and use it, uh, but is also uh, uses blockchain technology. So our notion is that there's a, it depends on the specific use case We'll get to that later, where this might reside. But for the graphical purposes, it's easier to show it out here somewhere. And these entities keep track of how well B has done in the past and serve that information up to you so they can do something with that information. And that actually looks like a transaction to some degree, right? Um, I'll come back to the value statement in a minute. Store it onto a distributed ledger. Usually when I give this talk, I have to give a long talk about what a distributed ledger is. I'm going to skip that. You guys know all that. And this consortium can look across all of that information and provide, they can compete potentially to provide this information to the, to the machines within the space. Um, okay, so broadly, if you really, 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 really needs that information, there's high value for it, then there's a flow of value from the U1, the user, to all of the verifiers who verify, including the one that's right, right now. Um, as well as potentially the blockchain 
consortium provider, which enables the trust reports to be delivered. Okay. In general, the problem with this construct is that this is a very fast moving space and anything that's got a blockchain is relatively slow. So there are ways, <laughs> I'll talk about it in a minute, to isolate what we need in terms of fast moving information here and relatively slow information interacting with the blockchain out there. All right, so this is this general notion, right? So the idea of how trustworthy is B is something that relates to all of B's interactions in the past with other entities. Maybe not these guys, maybe they weren't there, it doesn't matter, but somebody else, right? Okay, so I think for this crowd, you actually would you get the notion of it, but these roles are not really actually individual machines because individual machines can have all of those functions or many of those functions all at the same time. They're heterogeneous, they're different, right? But they're probably all gonna broadcast something, probably all gonna use something, and they may be able to verify better or worse. So physical entities in the near surface system, drones, vehicles, roadside units, could be playing multiple roles. And I didn't get a chance to update this slide, but really, it also kind of confuses things, but they all probably are broadcasters, all probably users, and they all may be verifiers. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter because the transactions can be uh, pulled together and the reports on how things went, essentially, the interactions for the localized interaction, the, the transaction that reports what happened in the localized interaction can be stored in the trust consortium and then extracted as needed to inform the next one. Okay, the next pickup game. All right, so now I'm gonna jump straight to, now we're gonna leave the sort of general IoT space. Well, let's talk specifically about cars and infrastructure. And I'm gonna leave the drones out of it for now. Okay, so, so what, what does this actually mean? Um, so the number one thing for this particular use case, when we get down on the ground, um, the planning horizons to move through an intersection like this, maybe four to 10 seconds of, of interest time, uh, I, you see, I've taken, I've stripped out in this intersection all of the uh, traffic signal controls. So if humans were coming into this intersection, we might expect a significant delay or at least some edging into the uh, intersection to see who would go first. But humans are actually pretty good at signaling with each other because we use things like turn signals and eye contact to you know, waving to each other to indicate what we might do to sort things out. And the world we've designed in terms of a roadway space are really built for humans. Okay, so now if we flip it around, we talk about a machine-driven system. They, right now, we're building autonomous vehicles to kind of mimic the best kinds of human driving, but in, in reality, I guess if we think about it, and it's certainly clear from our other non-civilian use cases, is that human signaling, so if, you, if you're automating human signaling, you may have a very inefficient system, right? But if you do pure autonomy based on that, you may find that these vehicles will never move because they are too afraid to, to get out there and do anything. So the, the question they might ask is, where does everybody want to go? Okay, so this particular vehicle might broadcast that in the next four seconds it, it wants to turn left. And that particular vehicle over there may have a more nuanced, thank you, a more nuanced view that, well, in the next four seconds I have some options. I could go left or I could go right. All these kinds of relatively complex information can be transmitted in ways that humans cannot share. So I'm not gonna stick my head out the window and say, hey, I'll go left or right. What do you guys think, right? It's not gonna work, right? But the machines can <laughs> kind of sort this out in a, in a relatively interesting way that is not an analog. It is not an analog of human interaction. I guess, and that's a, that's a sort of a critical observation and the truth of the matter is that these, once intent is shared, then we can resolve and make a decision about who goes where, and off they go. That's great. So that could be very, that could be very efficient. Some, some vehicles are not moving. Some vehicles are moving. Some vehicles may execute paths slower than others. And again, there's a value proposition in there. Those who go faster, value flows downhill from those who do not and also to those who maybe illuminate the space by making it closer. So what does shared intent get converted to through trust scores and, a, and, a, and sort of a, a value flow? 
essentially what we're doing is we're converting trust into additional capacity in the system. That's, that's essentially what this does in, the, in this particular use case. Because I know that Erica is a, has an excellent automated machine, I can follow her very closely because in the last 100 interactions with her, with that vehicle, we one centimeter longitudinal distance is all we need. And she's, and her vehicle can go 20 miles an hour, or it can go plus or minus 0.2 miles per hour over the target that has been indicated, has been planned, right? You're a great team player, right? You have high trust in the system, so I can trust Erica. The other nice thing about such a system is that if you have a weakened vehicle, then collectively as we share the information about where we're going and the obstacles that we see, the weakest vehicles are actually see the space illuminated at the highest level by the strongest illuminator, which essentially is, might be one of these infrastructure things on the side. So the point is that we may be able to increase the throughput of a purely automated intersection here, not by necessarily improving the vehicles, but just, but just by putting a piece of infrastructure that allows position or uh, other obstacles be detected with higher certainty. When certainty is high, speeds can be high. When certainty is high, following distances can be small. And that means, if you're a traffic engineer, more capacity. Okay. So who can we trust? It's not binary. We might really trust somebody's uh, uh, speed. that They follow paths very well, but they're not very good sensors. Anyway, we put them all together in this kind of um, collective mapping com combination. We can get a lot more throughput in the system. All right, so in my final two minutes. So here, here's the so what, because I'm, I do work as a consultant to the federal government, and so then the notion is, yeah, yeah, so what, for, for all of us in terms of being excited about what does orchestrated autonomy do for us uh, in this case? Well, the first is that there's a positive feedback in the system, right? So vehicles and roadside equipments that execute its plan, like Erica, earn higher trust ratings. <laughs> and so therefore, we can all move faster, but we can also ask Erica's vehicle to do much more difficult maneuvers and potentially faster maneuvers. So high trust means high speed movement. Low trust means you're stuck with passive autonomy, you need to move slowly. Shared intent in a trusted system, so for the individual is incentivized to be a good citizen and also to execute according to the plans. The, the other good news is that the system itself can get a lot more uh, throughput out of it. So the more complex and the more conflicts there is, the more likely the orchestrated autonomy will be uh, helpful. So platooning is great, but really multi-leg intersections with vehicles going opposite directions is where it has even uh, the most. So those kind of complex bottlenecks is even more uh, significant. So vehicles with high trust ratings, they experience faster, safer travel. But we need to watch out for the alien NCs in the system, the dark objects, the dogs, the pedestrians, the unconnected vehicles, vehicles full of drivers. That, all that information is, is there for them to avoid. What I will say is that it has been, some of our simulations have shown that at some point, the vehicles move so fast, even when they share intent, that a human driver or a disconnected driver can't really operate in the system. So imagine trying to merge into traffic. You know, like when you go down an off ramp, right, and you stop at the end, that's like the hardest time to get into traffic, right? Because people come by 65 miles an hour, and you gotta find a gap, right? Okay, so that, that kind of, that, that, that plays out here in that if the vehicles around you are going so fast, it's very hard for you to move at all unless you're part of the system, unless you're part of the, if you, if you share intent. And we reward those who play by the rules by including them into all the shared intent. And we punish those who do not by reducing their scores, potentially zeroing them out, leaving them like the vehicles at the end of the on-ramp. So last thing I'll say is the big so what is we think, based on some of our analyses, we can quadruple, quadruple the carrying capacity of the surface roadway system uh, with no change of right away. So essentially the footprint we have now we can get four times as many people and goods through. Notwithstanding Chris's point about more efficient strategic allocation of folks and vehicles. So with that, I will 
I'm out. Questions? Um, I don't really understand the role of the verifiers if you can't trust them. If you go to the, to the Trust Alliance to verify if a verifier does his work, why don't you cut them out completely? Right, so cross-verification is an excellent way of identifying whether or not the verification score is, can, be, um, can be trusted, right? So, so the, entity, the entity in the system may have different scores depending on the role it plays, but also from all the other interactions. So if, in fact, you are new to the system and you're verifying your neighbor the first time ever, we, do not tr we don't put a lot of weight in that, and it's in the trust score because you, you come in with very low trust, right? But after a, a thousand interactions and you are really, really good at lateral positioning, then we say, all right, well, your neighbor is reporting a position of, of such and such, and you're reporting that it's not quite right. We're like, okay, he's one of our top verifiers. We really use that information. So the trust is not binary, number one, and it's multidimensional <laughs> is the other critical thing, and it's earned over time. So you don't come in at one, which is the highest trust. You come in at zero, and you build your way up. Okay. Well, that's a great question. More, more good questions. So um, I think this is a pretty obvious question, but in the analogy in the physical world, uh, your turn signals and your braking and all those types of things are the equivalent of communicating intent, right? right? Today, though, we get punished if you put your blinker on and I'm going to get, try to get on the, or change lanes on the freeway, the guy's going to race up and take that gap away from me, right? Um, and I have no history of that. So I just have to make a rude decision to just come over. So are, are, when you talk about capturing this history and the trust factor, it's really measuring whether I am somebody who races forward and takes the gap away, or I'm somebody who doesn't signal or does signal. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get the analogy. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a, so that's a great one, right? So in this case, let's just say we we make a local plan that your merger is going to turn on, yes, on signals on, it's going to come in, it's doing all the things it's supposed to do. But the neighbor is like, oh no, you don't, and it comes roaring up, right? Well, we're not going to make a plan that says, oh no, you don't. Is we're not we're not trying to. So the plan would be, the spacing is just large enough for you to get in, right? And, this, and the, there's a very predictable speed from the vehicle that comes behind. So if that other vehicle did try to cut you off, their trust score would go down. Yours would go, well, yours would go up just because of the merging, right? So in the end, we might, we, we might assign a slower path to that. It's hard to say how do you constrain that particular behavior, but we would lower the score, right? And we wouldn't authorize sort of close following for that vehicle because we would say, you know, if you want to earn your trust back up, you need to allow these gaps, right? Um, so it's not just the machine, it's also the people that drive them and program them. So another sort of subset of this is, is misbehavior within the system policed? And so this is like a not, this is a, this is a way of policing generalized not misbehavior. So it could have been a hack or it just could have been a bad driver or a bad programmer or a kid in there was like, you know, come on, go faster, right? So the point is that, Whatever the misbehavior is, it's, it's associated with the machine regardless of its cause. One more quick one. Um, question, uh, does this need a um, change of legislation because of uh, if I'm driving an older car, not automated, and I just follow the current rules and I just turn left or right and uh, all the other cars do are making their own rules. So how do you see that? Right, right, it's, it's, it's a great, so the transition is always a, a difficult thing, right? Um, so what I can say is that I'm not advocating that I'm going to go out afterwards right now and tear down every traffic signal and erase the striping and wait for Nirvana to show up. It's not going to happen, right? So the point is we have to move through it. Um, so as long as you as the human driver continue to drive within the lane assigned to you and obey the, the rules of, the, of, of the driving, um, then we should all be okay because as the machine, I can predict your behavior based on the rules of expected human driving and avoid you and the speeds that you are assigned to, to take on, that's fine. But I may be able to go 75 or 85 through the intersection. You may be restricted to 25. As long as you do that, then everybody will be fine because I can execute the maneuver in my vehicle 
would have been impossible with a human driver or would seem frightening to a human driver, but we can execute it, and that's two cars through rather than just one car. So we just doubled the, the capacity of the intersection. Carl, thank you very much. That was great. Okay. <laughs> Next up, we have Bhaskar Krishnamachari, uh, professor at USC in electrical engineering and computer science, joint appointment. Uh, he's the director of the USC uh, Viterbi Center for Cyber Physical Systems and the Internet of Things. Uh, he's an academic researcher working on IoT, blockchain, wireless networks, connected vehicles, uh, and 